Hello folks, this is part two of our lecture on image maps and here we're going to be focusing on satellite platforms, sensors, and imagery. And so uh, our first part of the lecture we focused on aerial photography and now we're going to be focusing on satellite imagery and there's a number of properties that are distinct when we look at satellite imagery versus looking at aerial imagery. And as this slide indicates, uh, because we are higher up in space, we are going to be uh, covering a larger geographic footprint, but we're going to be getting typically less detail on that image. And so this would be considered a small scale relative to the larger scale aerial imagery. However, satellite technology has been improving and the resolution of the imagery that we're getting off of satellites is improving as well. Uh, and also we're seeing a variety of sensors that are being mounted on uh, satellites that are going to allow us to get not only the visible spectrum, but a variety of other parts of the non-visible spectrum of radiant energy that is being emitted from the Earth's surface. So our focus here is going to be on uh, passive sensors, but we will talk a little bit about active sensors as well. So in terms of advantages, as I mentioned, a high view, broad area gets surveyed. Um, Satellites are very stable. Um, we have satellites that have been in operation for upwards of 30 years. Uh, we have a wide spectral range, and uh, this includes multiple um, wavelengths or bands. And so we'll talk a little bit more about what that refers to here in a few minutes. Um, generally low cost, and the digital images are uh, optimal for integration into GIS. Some disadvantages, the limited flexibility, uh, generally on a fixed schedule, uh, limited spatial resolution, uh, the actual cell size, uh, requires sophisticated, uh, moderately expensive systems and skills to take advantage of digital, spectral, and spatial information. Um, basically what that means is that in order to be able to really maximize the benefit of satellite imagery from an analysis standpoint, you need some fairly sophisticated software and some fairly sophisticated skills. Uh, the introductory skills are taught in our Intro to Remote Sensing course as part of our GIS program. Okay, so as I uh, mentioned in the previous lecture, there are two types of sensors, uh, passive, which is the most common, uh, and active. And so in the passive uh, system, we have radiation that's received at the sensor that comes from an external, external source, namely the sun. And we're going to be looking at some different types of satellite imagery, including Landsat, MODIS, Iconos, and Quickbird satellites. Uh, in the active um, types of sensors, energy is generated from the sensor itself. It's beamed outward, and then some fraction of that energy is returned and measured. And the most common type that I want you guys to be familiar with is uh, what's called LIDAR. So again, in this image, we have uh, the passive on the left-hand side. We see the energy of the sun that's um, being uh, either reflected or absorbed and re-radiated from the Earth's surface and then being captured by the sensor. Uh, in contrast to the active sensor, in the case of LIDAR, you have a light beam that's sent down from a um, fixed-wing aircraft generally and it bounces back and they record the time that it takes and the result is very high resolution elevation data, in this case uh, the area around Turtle Bay. This is the Sundial Bridge at the top. Uh, this is the main museum. You can actually see the light posts. Um, this is the uh, coarse vegetation in the area. Another example of uh, LIDAR being used to measure tree heights in the Peruvian rainforest. Again, that's an active sensor. 
And in contrast, we have a passive sensor that can gather, in this case, just uh, true color. And this is familiar to most of us through Google Earth and other images that we have uh, observed. An essential quality of imagery is the spatial resolution, um, which is sometimes called the resolving power of an image. And in this case, um, we're looking at the spatial resolution of a digital image as representing the surface on the ground, uh, or the spatial sampling increment from which average values are collected and registered by the sensor. So essentially, what we're going to find out is that if we determine a certain pixel size, whether it's 1 meter, 10 meter, 20, 30 meter, or beyond, that those pixel sizes are going to di uh, dictate how much you can resolve off of the image. And they're using a football size, football field here to kind of indicate uh, how large um, an individual pixel value uh, will be. And so if we look at uh, spatial resolution, we might look at something like the MODIS satellite, which has a 250 meter, uh, a quarter of a kilometer uh, in size for a single pixel. And so it has a very big footprint, but it's quite coarse in its resolution. Uh, Landsat imagery has a 30 meter resolution pixel. Okay, so here's the MODIS pixel size, here's the Landsat pixel size. And then when we get into something like Iconos, we get into a very high resolution uh, that allows us to see, in this case, individual cars crossing the Golden Gate Bridge. These would be considered low, moderate, and high resolution or high spatial resolution imagery. And um, uh, the first two, the low and the moderate, are, are uh, widely available for free download, but the high resolution uh, typically um, costs and can be quite expensive. Okay, now when we talk about um, the spectral resolution, this describes the ability of a particular sensor, and you'll remember that a sensor is a camera or some other receiving instrument that is mounted on a particular satellite. And what we're seeing in this particular example is that we see wavelengths. This is actually for the, let me see if I can adjust the view here since it's cutting off just a little bit. There we go. So the Landsat uh, Enhanced Thematic Mapper um, program from NASA has a spectral resolution that ranges from 0.45 to 0.9 micrometers divided into eight distinct bands. So you see the wavelength bands, the number of the band, and the colors that they associate with those. Shorter wavelengths are in the blue area, and green will be in this range. And when we get to the 0.7, so 0.4 to 0.7 is going to be our visible spectrum. And then we're getting into the non-visible infrared, near infrared, short infrared, and what have you. And that has a distinct advantage because multi-spectral imagery allows for combining different bands and giving different views of the landscape. So again, this is uh, showing um, the Landsat bands 1 through 7, and you can see that each of them has a slightly different um, view. In this case, it's being shown in black and white, but we could attach blue to band one, green to band two, and so forth. And then different combinations will bring out different features on the landscape. Perhaps the most striking example of this is the false color infrared, in which healthy vegetation shows up as red. And uh, this is something where we're able to uh, view something that wouldn't be otherwise visible to uh, to our eyes. So two different examples at different scales of false color infrared. A little bit of uh, kind of technical details on short wave versus long wave radiation. 
And all of this fits into this broad topic of the electromagnetic spectrum. I'm not going to be asking you uh, a whole lot of details on this, but you should be familiar with the fact that uh, typically in imagery we're interested in and able to view the visible and the infrared parts of the uh, spectrum. That's the most common uh, for imagery applications. So again, combining different bands of multispectral imagery, you can see this is the same exact geographic locale, and we have bands 3, 2, 1 that are combined to produce a natural color composite, a false color composite using bands 4, 3, and 2, 4 being the near infrared, produces the false color red, and you can see that this is really giving us uh, a kind of a unique perspective, including the ability to uh, perhaps discern the water more clearly than we do in the natural color. So, of course, there are different capabilities that we have within our software, um, which we'll explore a little bit in our lab this week. When we talk about spaceborne sensors, um, commonly we will refer to um, multispectral sensors uh, and then looking at low spatial resolution, low or moderate, uh, which will give us a coarse scale. Again, generally lower cost, government sponsored, widely available, larger pixel sizes like 30 meters, which is the pixel size for uh, Landsat. And then we get into the higher spatial resolution, as I mentioned, higher cost, uh, smaller geographic extent, smaller pixel sizes, higher storage and processing requirements because you've got more pixels for a given image, but of course a greater ability to resolve things off of the image. So these are a variety of moderate resolution imagery that you would like that I'd like you to be familiar with. I mentioned Landsat, uh, perhaps the most common and widely available imagery. Uh, MODIS, we saw, has the large footprint that allows us to cover um, large geographic areas uh, with a very coarse pixel size. Uh, and then uh, Aster, another government program, about 15 meter resolution. Uh, Geos, we'll see in a minute and SPOT, which is a European satellite system, which provides 10 meter spatial resolution. So uh, three times the resolving power of Landsat, which has 30 meter resolution. Okay, we'll take a look at this uh, later. The uh, GOES, the geospatial, uh, geostationary uh, satellite system, which is used for uh, weather forecasting. Again, widely available imagery. Quite an interesting image. You see all the uh, flight path streaks coming across this natural uh, weather coming in. And then high spatial resolution satellites. Um, less concerned about you knowing all of these different names, but you can see that we're getting into um, one meter and even uh, sub meter, less than a meter um, resolution for different aspects of uh, different satellite platforms. So again, the, the resolution is steadily improving with these types. We'll see you all in lab tomorrow to explore what we've talked about in these lectures.